He is risen. All right. See, uh, I didn't grow up saying that. And so um, I didn't know the response. What's, what's supposed to be the response? So people used to say to me, he has risen. I was like, yeah, he has. And so um, years like history, hundreds and hundreds of years of Christian history, it's he has risen, he has risen indeed. And it's just the celebration, the realization that each Sunday is what we celebrate, that Jesus has defeated death. Um, every time I get to Easter, I get out um, challenged. I don't, I, like, I kind of like to teach um, uh, stories that people haven't heard much before. I kind of like to draw into um, different passages that maybe you have heard before, like really dig for the place that you might not have thought about and maybe leave you thinking, hmm, wow, I never thought about that before. And that's kind of like where I like to live in my teaching. And it's really hard to do that with a story like Easter, right? Because it doesn't matter who you are, you kind of you kind of know the basics of Easter as far as the, the facts of Easter, like, you know, what it is, generally speaking. And so I never know, like, where to start, I mean, where to go in the scriptures, because you can go anywhere, really. I mean, you can kind of just dive into anywhere you want to go in, and you can just find Easter there, period. And so sometimes I think, you know what, the best thing that we can do is maybe just start at the very beginning. And so I think Genesis and when I think of Genesis, I think, man, this is, like, th this is at the very, very earliest entrance of sin into God's perfect plan, into his perfect reality. And Adam and Eve sin, and right there in the middle of God's judgment on sin, God gives a little foreshadow of Jesus. He says this in Genesis chapter 3, and I... This is God, I will cause hostility between you and the woman. This is God announcing his curse on the serpent, on the, 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 the personification, if you will, of Satan. And I will cause hostility. There, there will be hostility between evil and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring. He's like, hey, there's going to be a battle that gets played out here. And then he says this, and he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And at the very beginning of the scriptures, at the very moment that sin enters the world, God gives a little foreshadow that there's going to be a time coming where evil will be defeated, where the head of evil will be put down. So sometimes I think we could just stick here and I could dig in there for a while and just teach about how that's played out throughout human history. How, how evil strikes at the heel. How there is real damage that goes on in this world because evil is very real. And at the same time, we live, although we feel the effects of evil, like we know that, that, that evil has been defeated. And the war still rages, but there's, the end is not in doubt. And so I think we start there. Or then I think, no, you know, like if you just, I mean, if you really dig into some of the Old Testament prophecy, you kind of get this picture that emerges about Easter because it, it's... It's uncanny almost how detailed some of the prophets are about this event, about what's going to happen, about who Jesus is. In fact, sometimes I read these um, passages, and this one I'm going to read in a second, is written six or seven hundred years before Jesus was even born. And I think, when I read this, I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding. Listen, people, when, when historians study this, and people who don't necessarily have a high view of Scripture, when they study this, they realize how painfully accurate this is in describing who Jesus is and what he did. It's so accurate that they say this could not have possibly been written six or seven hundred years ago. It had to be written after Jesus lived on the earth because it's just too accurate in how it describes it. And yet the problem with that is the historical evidence puts it at six and seven hundred years before Jesus was on the earth. And I think, man, we could just dive into the prophets and we could just like, live in the Old Testament prophecy that foresaw this coming. 
and the prophets who announced, and there was some, a remnant always, who believed that there was a coming Messiah and that he was going to make the difference. And they lived every day, they lived their entire lives in the hope that that would happen. And they never saw it. And Isaiah, he writes, my servant, speaking of Jesus, my servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and to cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life. And the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. And I think it's it's only the supernatural prompting of God's spirit leading a person to write this six hundred years before Jesus was even on the earth. And sometimes I think of the people who study the Old Testament who don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. I was like, how do you explain this part away? It's so accurate. And, and then this is just one of hundreds of prophecies that, that foreshadow the coming of Jesus and different aspects of his life. And I think, man, Easter, that's when we need to say, hey, this this is not something new. Even way before Jesus was on the earth, this was coming, and they knew it. And so I think we should start in the prophets. But then you think, well, you start in Genesis, and that's a little obscure. You start in the prophets, and that's kind of like, well, it's good, but it's so long ago. So like, then you think, oh, we just need to stick with Jesus' own words. I mean, Easter needs to be filled with the words of Jesus and his actions. And I remember, like, one of, the, one of the most poignant moments that I look at in the life of Jesus is when he's leading his disciple and he gets this critical point because they know, the disciples know that something big, like, they're, they're a part of a movement here. Something big is going on. And so when they get that idea that, that this is going to be a big deal, then there starts to become some positioning among the disciples. Kind of like, all right, well, we're we're going somewhere here. Like, you know, who's going to be, like, we all know that Jesus is first in command, but who's going to be second and third? Who's going to be at his right and left? And so all the disciples, his closest inner circle, they're starting to debate this. And I think, wow, like, that's just like, it's just like me. That's just like you. It's just like our own selfish ambition. Trying to, trying to hang on to Jesus' coattails to take us where we can't go, but also to make sure we get our piece of the pie in the process. And in the midst of that, like, like Jesus speaks into it. And he says, guys, hey, whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. Right here in the, in the midst where, where <clears throat> Jesus is, is seeing this human ambition play out right in front of his face in this close group of, you know, of his closest friends, this inner circle, and, and he sees this pulling and pushing and this ambition almost trying to rip this thing apart. And he, and he speaks to him and he says, hey guys, this, that's, not, that's not what this is about. And he says this, for for even I, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
I think, you know, it's Easter, and we need to sit here, and we need to just talk about the words of Jesus. We talk about Jesus didn't come into the realization that he was finally the Messiah. He wasn't a superhuman that realized that there was a deity in him. None of the, all the movies kind of portray Jesus that way. Jesus knew who he was. He left heaven to come to earth. This wasn't a a wake-up moment from some guy who was really special. And he comes in, and even when the positioning goes on, he says, guys, this is why I'm here. And I think we should sit on Jesus' words. This is why Jesus came, to give his life as a ransom. He knew why he was here. He knew what he was coming to do. And we should should relish the love and and just know that that all the, the plans of the last week of of passion that we celebrate each time this year, it was ordained, it was ordered by God. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't God's plan getting hijacked by the Roman Empire. It wasn't God's plan getting hijacked by the Jewish religious leaders. It was who God made Jesus. It was who he made this plan to be. It was what he, he wanted to see happen. And I think we should just stick in the words of Jesus. But then I think, well, then there's such an incomplete picture, kind of. Because then you get to, like, the, 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 the writings of the New Testament and the, apostle, uh, the apostles, and I think particularly the Apostle Paul. And because he's lived with the life of Jesus for kind of, you know, several years and, and, and the, the, the implications of Jesus' death and resurrection, like, we get a more complete picture than we do anywhere else in the Bible. And I think, wow, like, here's Paul. Philippians, that's one of my favorite passages. I always wanted to teach this on Easter because I think this is it. Philippians chapter 2, it just kind of says, hey guys, this is who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to have the same attitude in us that was found in Christ Jesus. Though he was God, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, He gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and he was born as a human being. Just becoming a human being, just being born, just Christmas was an incredible sacrifice to the God of the universe to creep into flesh and to take on the limitations of that. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on the cross. And I think we ought to really just stick at Easter. We ought to just stick in this moment where it's like, ooh, wow. Like, this is big here. This is the complete picture. This is Paul writing from the the perspective of way before even Genesis. Like, before this whole thing began, it was God and it was Jesus in heaven. And Jesus agreed to the plan that said, I'm going to take on human form and I'm going to give my life and humble my life in obedience to God and I'm going to die a criminal's death on the cross. And I think that's where we should stay. Or then I think sometimes on Easter, like we should really just do this kind of apologetics thing because, you know, like there just needs to be an idea out there Um, that we need to give people reasons to believe. And we understand that there's doubt involved, but we also understand that there's some reasonable explanations about all these events. And the burden of proof is often on, you know, put on Christians, but actually the burden of proof is is to prove that he didn't raise from the dead. I mean, you just kind of think through the historical implications of, of how this story unfolds. And the reaction and the response of those who saw Jesus alive after they had seen him die. And I think, wow, like that's, that's where we need to stick. And I, I go to this moment. <clears throat> it's got to be just a powerful moment. Because Jesus has appeared to many of his disciples. But when he appeared to a lot of his disciples after he had risen from the dead, Thomas was not there with them. And they kept telling Thomas, hey, we have, we have seen, we have seen the Lord. Thomas, you, I mean, like with our own eyes, we've seen him. 
And Thomas replied, hey guys, I'm not going to believe this until I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them. It's not enough to see him. He's, he's, he's got to touch it and place my hand into the wound in his side. Guys, I, you, you got to, like, I don't know if I would be offended if I was Peter or James or John, and I'm sitting there talking to Thomas, and we've been together for several years now, and, and been with Jesus, and we'd heard Jesus' words, we'd seen Jesus' miracles, and my closest friends, Jesus' closest followers, that said, we have seen Jesus. He is alive. I've seen him. And Thomas just says, sorry, I, I can't go on that. I, I need more. I need more proof. I need something tangible. I need something I can touch and feel. I want to put my, my fingers into the wounds. And unless I do that, you're not going to convince me. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. But suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. I don't think I'd have a whole lot of peace. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hand. Put your hand in the wound on my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And I think, you know, this is, this is the compassion of Jesus for the those that just struggle with belief, with trust. I mean, he could have easily just dismissed Thomas and just be like, well, but you know what? He gave Thomas what Thomas needed. He said, come on. This is what you need to believe. Here I am. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. And so sometimes I think, man, we should just stick right here. Because, you know, this event, when you speak of it to people who don't believe, it kind of comes off like, oh, like somebody come back from the dead. That just, it's just like a movie more than reality. And you're putting your hope and trust in that. You know, how can you do that? And all the questions and all the doubts. And we tend to get frustrated with the doubts of other people, and we get defensive, and we kind of just ostracize them a little bit or push them a little bit out of the side. And I think Jesus just says, hey, come on in. What do you need? What do you need to believe? And I think it's that invite. And I think, man, we should just stick here over and over again at the ways that Jesus pursues people, that he pursues their, their, their doubt. And he encourages, he gives them what they need to believe. And when it comes to Easter, I think, man, we should just stay there. But then right at the end of that story, Jesus says something to Thomas and to the others. And he says, guys, look, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. And see, here's where I think, wow, this gets hard. Here's where I, I want to dig in sometimes because, you know, the disciples themselves had trouble believing. And they had so much more proof, so much more understanding, so much more experience than you and I will ever have in our entire life. And they still had trouble believing. Even at the point where Jesus is ascending to heaven and he gives them the great commission in Matthew chapter 28, right before he gives them that. And it still says, and some of them still doubted. And I think, you stupid idiots, how can you doubt? You're watching a guy who you saw die, who you put in the grave, and he's in front of you giving you instructions and ascending to heaven. How much more do you need, people? I mean, that's kind of how I get to them. And that they struggled to believe. And then I think, wow, like, if they struggled to believe, I, I, we, we will probably struggle to believe too, yeah? Because they have so much more than we'll ever have. 
And that's what Jesus speaks to. He's like, but like you guys, you guys believe because you have seen, you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. And that's that's where that's where I think, wow, we got to dig in there. So this morning, we want to dig in here. Because, you know, we can go to Genesis, or we can go to the prophets, or we can go to the words of Jesus, or we can go to the theology of the Apostle Paul, or we can go back to these encounters where Jesus is digging in at doubt and belief and the struggles of all that. But, but, but honestly, all that just kind of is one step removed from like right here, right now. And so as I was praying through this this week, God gave me this idea, and I thought, ah, oh, that's a crazy idea. I don't know how that's going to work, and I don't know how it's going to work. And so we're going to try it. Because a guy called me two weeks ago and said, hey, I need to meet. And I hadn't talked to this guy in six or seven years. And we sat down 13 days ago, Tuesday night, at Rocky River Coffee in Harrisburg. And he just shared with me, like, what's going on in his life. And I thought, you know, that's, like, that's what Easter's about. Like that, that moment, that, that night talking through who Jesus is, what he did, and what difference it makes to us here today, now. Like, that's what this, that's what Easter is really about. And so um, I'm going to invite this guy up to stage. So Dave, you come on up, and I just want uh, I want you guys to hear from Dave Adams. So uh, yeah, come on up, y'all. I give him a hand. All right. Um, Dave, I appreciate you doing this, man. <laughs> I I actually prepped him. I was like, Dave, uh, I was talking to him on. Um, have a seat, man. Um, I was talking to him on Wednesday night, and I was like, hey, I got, I got, a, I got a strange idea. You, you might, I don't know if you're going to be up for it or not. He's like, I, I'm up for anything. I was like, all right, let me pray about it for another day, and I'll, talk, I'll call you back, and we'll talk. And, and uh, I talked to him on Thursday night, and I was like, hey, I know you've just been a believer for a little bit more than a week now, but will you come up and share um, you know, what Jesus has done. And so, um, Dave, uh, when we sat down, he, he shared with me that he'd been through a divorce a couple years back, and it just kind of left him uh, really not being able to trust anybody in his life, in his world. And, um, and that's kind of where we started, yeah? So, uh, I told you I wouldn't ask you anything that I didn't write down, and so... <laughs> Um, tell me, tell me, um, tell me what led you to give me a call a couple weeks ago. You know, I, uh, I had finally hit the bottom. I was, I was, I, you, you spoke of Thomas and that's kind of what I felt like. I didn't really believe I wanted to see, I had to see it to believe it. Yeah. But instead of seeing it, I felt it. Hmm. I was led to. I changed jobs and I was led to this job that I that I took and there was a guy that worked there um, in this room by himself and I just happened to walk in there and I'm like hey man how's it going and he's like I can help you he didn't know me he just met me that day I was new hmm. and uh, ended up talking to this guy his name was Casey and he had been saved a couple years ago and had been through the same exact thing I had gone through. And uh, that led me to, to call on David because I had been uh, close to David, like he said, six or seven years ago. And I just kind of fell out and, and walked away because I didn't believe. Yeah. Um, and, and now I do. Yeah. So when we talked at the coffee shop, you kind of started out telling me that, um, I mean, right up front, you kind of said, hey, I, I think I need Jesus in my life. I mean, straight up. It was, <laughs> um, 
And uh, you kind of mentioned this Casey at work and, and um, you know, what brought you to the point where you believe that Jesus could really make a difference? I mean, like, was it, was it you know, was it desperation? Like, what's going through, you, through your mind? It's, it's all that. I mean, you, you get to a certain point where life is just hard and it's not supposed to be as hard as, as what it is at that time in I had trust issues with everybody. I mean, I didn't trust Jesus. I didn't trust my girlfriend. I didn't trust anybody. I didn't even trust my parents. You know, my parents told me something. I was like, nah, you know, I'm doing okay. I'll just keep living the way I'm living. And it just wasn't right. And it just finally figured out. I mean, I have to give a lot of credit to Casey. I have to give a lot of credit to my girlfriend. She led me um, down this road. She said, you need to do something can't keep going on the way you're going and everybody was right I I when I asked what do I who do I call what do I do I think God answered my prayers and said hey you call David Henderson he helped you before I think he can help you again um I didn't know what he was going to say he hadn't talked to me in six or seven years so I was like I didn't oh, know what you're going to say he might hang up the phone he didn't even you know? tell me he's like hey I just need to get together we need to talk and I was like all right and I had no idea even what, what that was about. So when you started at that, I was like, ah, oh, this is going to be an easy one, you know, because God's already done the work of saying, hey, this is, this is the realization. Like, um, when we were talking on the phone this past Thursday, you, you kind of shared, like, hey, it's crazy how many, you're, you're in the race industry. It's crazy how many people there, you said probably 80% 80, 80, 80 of the people, they're, they're where they've always dreamt they would hope to be in their life like this is kind of reaching the pinnacle and yet like 80 percent of these guys are just hollow shells empty with all the desperation and all the thoughts that they can't turn off like like tell me what you see well you know I, I started out as a kid being from Vermont and uh, my dad was a racer so I became a racer um, just because I I always looked up to my dad and yeah, in, in, in the racing industry, being in Charlotte, North Carolina, and, and going to the Cup Series is, is the way to go. And I spent a lot of time there, had a lot of success, won a lot of races, but it didn't matter. Mm. It, none of that matters because I wasn't living the way I was supposed to live. And you always felt like you needed something more. And what I needed was Jesus in my life. Yeah, but and, he, and, he, and he wasn't there. So, yeah. and, I, and I'm way you live this life and you think that you're living right because you've got everything you've got money you've got cars you've got houses you've got success you're on tv you know people see you you're they recognize you none of that matters none of that matters i mean i want to be successful i i am successful but i've become more successful in the last two weeks than i've been yeah. in 20 years of racing yeah yeah that's good yeah that's good <laughs> Um, you know, you grew up, you always heard something about Jesus or, you know, you kind of know, you, you knew the basics. What, you know, take me back to Tuesday night last week. What's the difference? What, like, what's the difference between knowing about Jesus and trusting him, like trusting him as your savior? Like, to talk to us about like what, what's going on in your heart at the moment that you put your faith in Christ? It, it, it changes your life. I mean, like I said, I was at the bottom. I, I didn't trust anybody. Now I have, I feel like I have trust for everybody in my life. Um, and I didn't have that. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was lost. And I, to, I told you on the phone, I think, that it felt that night when I, when I walked away from David and I got in my car and I called my girlfriend and I talked to her for 45 minutes on the way home and I said it feels like a giant weight was lifted off of my shoulders mm -hmm. and I'd been carrying it around for a lot of years and like you said you know even at the top of my game when I was when I was successful I was still carrying that weight on my shoulders I was never really able to enjoy that I feel like in the last two weeks I've become the person that was inside that person has come out because of Jesus Christ. You know, he's led me down the right path. 
I've seen some signs. I told David I, I was driving down the road and I and I had a question and I asked, I asked Jesus. You know, I said, show me a sign, please. Show me something. I got I gotta have something. Boom. Ten seconds later, my phone beeped and I had a message and it was exactly what I needed. And I said, well, how can I not believe this? There yeah. it is. Yeah. You know. So what would you say to somebody that's maybe here who has just heard about Jesus, uh, knows the facts, but just has not put their trust in his death and resurrection to forgive them of their sins and to give them new life? Like, what, what would you encourage them with? I would, the first thing I would say is, is it's never too late. Yeah. You know, I, I thought that a lot. I was like, oh, it's too late. I've, I've gone too far down this road. I've lived this life where, you know, I haven't lived right. It, but it's never too late. Don't ever give up uh, hope. I know there's probably some people out here right now saying, uh, you know, it's too late. Who's this guy? You know, they've never seen me before. But I'm telling you, if you give yourself to Jesus mm -hmm. and let him lead you down the right road, your life will be better. Yeah. I mean, it's only been, like you said, 13 days. I can't tell you that it's been, you know, that I've been doing this for 10 years or whatever. I should have been, but I wasn't. And the last two weeks have been totally different. It's been great. I feel at peace. Everything David says, he puts up on the screen. I'm like, oh, that pertains to me. You know, and that pertains to everybody out here, too. I yeah. mean, it, it, don't, don't doubt it like Thomas did. You know, you're not going to be able to feel it but, or, or actually touch it. Yeah. You're going to be able to feel it in your heart. I didn't get to touch it, but I got to feel it. I got to feel it because he led me down that path to Casey. Casey's the only guy that I ever met in my industry that was able to like come forward and he wasn't embarrassed or whatever to come forward and say, you know what, I was saved two years ago. Yeah. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. But, but in, in, in on that point, isn't it hard, you know, because it's not like you're perfect for the last 13 days. No. Like, we're just forgiven, right. you know. And so right. it's kind of the, the feeling sometimes is I can't speak out or I can't share unless, um, because if I share, then I kind of put the spotlight on me and I've got to all of a sudden reach some kind of standard when this whole thing is not, is, it's, it's confession that we never could meet a standard. Right. You know, Jesus met the standard for us, and that's, you know, that's what we're putting our faith in. So our hope's not in ourselves or our perfection or our ability to obey. It's in Jesus and his obedience on our behalf. Right. And, and how's that felt over the last couple oh. of days? I mean, because you do feel, the, okay, now, now I've kind of got to, what's this mean? I, I mean, obviously I want to follow Jesus closer, um, but I'm not perfect. Right. I mean, nobody, nobody's perfect. I mean, yeah. e even you're, you know, probably yeah. not perfect. No, you know? no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We think you are. I mean, when yeah, I sit up Yeah, well, there, all you got to do perfect. is talk to those close to me. You'll know real fast. My kids, but, just get, just say, how's yeah, your dad? Yeah, yeah, I might talk to them. After yeah, after well, here, you'll get an earful. You know, <laughs> the, the, the hardest thing I ever did was was making that call to David and then meeting him face-to-face -face was even harder than, than the call because the call was actually kind of easy because I could hide behind the f telephone. Everybody does that nowadays. You know, there's no personal contact. And then David said, well, let's meet. And I was like, well, okay, I'll do it. And I met with him. And the hardest thing I ever did was say, listen, I'm wrong. I've been, doing, I've been living wrong. I haven't been doing the right things. I've lived this way, and I want to change. Yeah. It's hard for people to admit that they need to change. But you do need to change. If you haven't found Jesus yet, you need to change. It's a great feeling. I mean, you ask me what the feeling was like. It's great. I mean... It, it, I'm a different person. It, my girlfriend made the comment. Um, it was like three or four days after I met with you. She said, wow, this is the guy that I've always wanted. And I knew he was in there. Now here he is. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And this, this, is, uh, this is what Easter's about. It really is, guys. Um, Jesus' words in John chapter 10, uh, verse 10. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Like, you know, 
This is why Jesus came. This is why he died and he rose again. To give us the life that God originally created us to enjoy and live here. It's a rich and satisfying life. And guys, this is the picture. This is, this is, this is the world that God wants everyone to kind of step into. A better, a more satisfying life, an abundant kind of life that, that doesn't have to wait till heaven. It starts right now. And that's what Jesus died to provide you. I'm going to, um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to serve you communion. This will be the first time you receive communion, right? Yes. So, um, and uh, actually, if those who are uh, serving communion will come on up and get in their place. Um, and I'm going to steal this this one because uh, Jesus died and before before he went to the cross he uh, met with his disciples for the Passover meal it's a meal that they had celebrated since they were little kids it's a meal that their parents and grandparents and grandparents before them celebrated for hundreds and hundreds of years it's the Passover meal celebrating the Passover lamb the blood that was shed over the doorpost while the people of Israel were in Egypt and when the death angel came through as a punishment on their stubborn disobedience of the Egyptians God just commanded them to wipe that blood on the doorpost and the death angel would pass over their household and this meal that got celebrated once a year for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years Jesus says we're going to celebrate the Passover guys and then he says this this is not just the Passover meal this bread this bread is my body it's my body broken for you and this this juice, you're going to have to get another piece. Sorry, I didn't give you good instructions. Okay. No, no, no. This is awesome. Because this is how we do it here, okay? This is so good. Thanks, Dave. Grab a piece. Don't put it in your mouth. Grab a piece. It's okay. No, grab a piece. And then we're going to dip it. I was hungry. I'm sorry. It's okay. We're going to dip it in the juice that represents the blood of Jesus Christ. I didn't prep him for this, I've all right? I've done this before. There it is. It's, it's good. <laughs> this is the blood of Jesus shed for your sins. Take and eat. God, we're grateful. I'm grateful for Dave. Grateful that uh, you choose to choose to lavish your love on us. Grateful for the sacrifice of your son that we can stand here forgiven. Grateful for your body that's broken for us and your blood that was shed for us. Grateful for the new life, the abundant life, the rich and satisfying life that you came to promise and provide. We're just grateful. Grateful that you defeated death. And God, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you choose to use us as your messengers, as your hands and feet, as your voice. Like, did I get to sit down at coffee with Dave and not share what I can do, but share what you have done, what you have accomplished for us all? We're grateful, we're humble, we're thankful. And we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand right now and come and receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ?